<clears throat> we'll, we'll start off with a couple of songs. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we approach your throne of grace with humble hearts. Because, dear Lord, we know who we are approaching, the creator of this universe of all things. And Heavenly Father, the, the one who breathed life into our lungs, the one who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory because you are due. We give you all the respects because you are due. And we love you so very much, Heavenly Father. We are grateful for every opportunity we have to come together, even through these difficult times with COVID, that we have this method that we could still be together, your church, although separate, still able to worship you, still able to sing praises to you, still able to approach you in prayer and partake of the Lord's Supper. There are so many things, Heavenly Father, we have to be thankful for, even in these hard times. <clears throat> but again, especially having our relationship with you and our brothers and sisters in Christ. So, dear Lord, as we enter into this hour, we um, give you, again, uh, prayers of thanks. Um, as we uh, sing praises to you again and just have to con constantly say, holy, 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 we are so blessed to have you as our God. We give these prayers and thanks in the Son, in your Son's name. Amen. All right, we're going to start off with uh, a couple of songs. <coughs> song before the lesson is you are my all in all
I couldn't hear you, Brad. I don't know uh, if you were speaking or what. Yeah, no, no volume. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. Nah, got you. Just as okay. long as everybody Please. can hear me. Yep. So that's good. Well, good evening, everybody. It is wonderful to be given a opportunity to uh, speak before you. Uh, I know this is a little odd that we're all on Zoom, but you know, in these in these times, uh, the Bible does tell us nothing is new under the sun. So I'll bet you they had harder things to fight through than a than a uh, pandemic. This evening, I'd like to talk at length about a particular Bible character that I started to think about this character after hearing Eugene's sermon last Sunday evening when he talked at great length about David. And we talk so often about the men of the Bible. But we have to remember there's some very impressive women in the Bible also. This evening, I want to go through pretty much the book of Esther. Now, we know uh, a much beloved story in the Bible is that of Esther. She's a Jewish girl who becomes queen of Persia. And then after that, at great risk to her own life, she intercedes to save her people. I like to think of her as a, a paragon of both virtue and beauty, long noted for being lovely and beautiful and having faith and courage. She certainly serves as a role model for young women today to see how, let's first review the book. Now, when I finish with this, this review, I hope not to take too long on this, but when I finish it, I wanna make a comparison between David Esther, some of the other people that we read of in the Bible. And I want to I want to take just a moment at the end to really take note of why did God use these people? Why did God use David? Why did God use Paul in the New Testament? Why does he use Esther here? Well, we see as we begin the book of Esther, King Ahasuerus of Persia, he has a six month celebration. Now I can't hardly understand a celebration that lasts that long. The only thing close to it that I can remember is we did have the, uh, uh, the Jubilee for Queen Elizabeth in England in 2002. Now that lasted a full year. So there are some similarities there. At the end of this feast, he holds us or at the end of this celebration, he holds a seven day feast. And in this seven day feast, there is also one that is held by his wife, Queen Vashti for the women. We read of this in chapter one, verses one through nine. Well, unfortunately, as what happens with most feasts, Ahasuerus gets uh, a little inebriated. Toward the end of this, uh, we read in verses 10 through 12, Ahasuerus decides to show off his wife. He decides to bring Vashti into the celebration and show her off because she is quite beautiful. Well, as she should have, she refuses. Ahasuerus, her husband, has, has drunk far too much in this seven days. He's probably not in his right mind. She refuses to cooperate. But we see in verses 13 through 22 of chapter one, in his anger, Ahasuerus has Vashti banished. He does this as a warning to all wives that the husband should be the head of the household and, and by golly, that wife better toe the line, so to speak. Well, as we begin chapter two, we see a search to replace Vashti begins. <clears throat> In Shushan, there was Mordecai, a Jew who was raising his lovely, beautiful cousin, Hadassah, who is Esther. Together with other beautiful virgins, she is sent uh, to the palace for 12 months of preparation. And ultimately, she is selected to replace Vashti. During this whole time, she does not reveal, though, 
that she is a Jew because Mordecai asked her not to. Meanwhile, at the end of chapter two, we see that there is a plot against Ahasuerus and Mordecai catches wind of it, passes word through to Esther who warns the king, the king double checks it, the threat is verified and lo and behold, those who were plotting against the king are put to the gallows. Shortly about this time, we see at the beginning of verse three, we, we, in, we are introduced to a very, very integral character in this book, Haman. Haman the Agagite. Uh, it's a, a word dis, difficult to say. I, I hope I don't have to repeat it too much this evening. Haman is promoted, but Mordecai as a Jew refuses to bow before him. And this just infuriates Haman. Now, I, I have to say, I do have almost a little bit of firsthand knowledge of what this can be like. When I was in the military, we had many people who would go from E-4 senior airman to E-4 sergeant. Uh, Brad, is my audio breaking up or? I can't hear you again, Brad, but that's all right. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I'm still coming through to the others. What happens is in the Air Force, E-4 senior airman and E-4 sergeant are the same pay grade. There's no difference. The difference is, is the E-4 sergeant is considered a non-commissioned officer and he is now responsible for any of his actions. Well, you would not believe the, the power trip some people take by getting that star in the center of their Chevron. They're now a sergeant. They, they want to push their weight around a little bit. And sometimes it's more than just a little bit. Well, that's kind of like Haman. He's promoted. He wants everybody to bow before him, but Mordecai refuses, and he is just totally infuriated. Haman receives permission at this time to kill the Jews on the 13th of Adar, the 12th month. Mordecai mourns in sackcloth and ashes at the king's gate. Things are not looking good for Esther's people. Esther hears of her cousin and learns of Haman's plan to kill the Jews. Mordecai convinces Esther in chapter four, verses 10 through 17 to approach the king. Now this is at great risk of her own life. If you approach a king and you speak out of turn, there is a good chance you just might lose your head so she's going to do this she's going to do this at great peril to her own life esther is granted an audience invites the king and haman to a banquet she invites them to another banquet the following night to make her petition as haman leaves he is angered when mordecai refuses to bow to him his wife and friends persuade him to build a gallows for Mordecai. This is going to be interesting toward the end of this book. That night, the king can't sleep. And so he, he turns to his archives and he turns to read. And lo and behold, he ends up turning to where Mordecai thwarts the plot against him. Yet nothing has been done for Mordecai to honor him. The king asks Haman what should be done to honor a good man. And Haman assumes the king is speaking about him. Well, uh, not, not Haman's lucky day here. Haman assumes the king intends to honor him. He answers accordingly. The king then has Haman bestow the honor on Mordecai. 
Haman returns home ashamed and even more furious than ever before. The next day, the king and Haman dine again with Esther. She tells of the plot to kill the Jews, her own people, and she accuses Haman directly. In anger, the king leaves, soon returning to find Haman assaulting Esther. Uh, again, not a good move for Haman. Informed of the gallows Haman has built for Mordecai, the king hangs Haman on it. Esther is given Haman's house. Mordecai is promoted. Plans are made to save the, uh, the plan to save the Jews is made. It is successful. The Jews are spared, their enemies destroyed. Esther and Mordecai institute the Feast of Purim to commemorate the Jews' deliverance. Mordecai is now exalted to become second to King Ahasuerus of Persia. Mordecai becomes a great, uh, becomes great and well received among the Jews, seeking their good and speaking peace to them. What an exciting book this is. If you ever have the time, just just take and, and read it at your leisure. Read through every verse, every word. Esther goes through a lot of pains. She goes through a lot of, of uh, issues where she could be at great peril, but she stays faithful to God. So as I, as I wanna review just a, a, a bit here, I know I've got a lot of time left to work with, but Esther's beauty and virtue, Esther is amazing. She was lovely, she was beautiful, we see that from uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. It says, And Mordecai had brought up Hadessa, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. He thought that highly of Esther. She was taken along to the, to the, uh, uh, with many other young women to the, uh, to the palace, uh, let me, excuse me, almost, almost went to the wrong place there. So it was uh, verse eight in chapter two. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard. And when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Hester was taken uh, to the king's palace in the care of Haggai, the custodian of women. She pleased Haggai the custodian who advanced her to the best places. She underwent 12 months. Can you imagine 12 months of preparation? When I was, when I was back again, when I was uh, first in the, in, the, in the Air Force, one of the first tech schools I went through was up at uh, Lowry Air Force Base, Denver, Colorado. There were some people there that were proposing marriage to women after meeting them for only about six hours. The preparation for all these women to be brought to the king was 12 months of preparation. She obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. She was loved by Ahasuerus above all women. She was a woman of great virtue. She was a virgin up to her selection by the king. She honored Mordecai uh, as her surrogate father. She followed his advice. How many of us men who have daughters want our daughters to follow our advice? Oh, it is so important. They don't always, but at least now, I know in, in, in my older years here, uh, I say older, I mean, I'm, I'm still only in my 60s, but yeah, it's, it's older than I used to be. When I look at my daughters, I know they had rough patches that they went through, but things are turning out very well now. And it's, 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 it's a marvelous thing when, when you see things coming, coming good for your, your children. She follows his advice uh, not to really reveal her ethnicity 
and yet she still remains in contact with him. She manifested faith in God's providence. She accepts Mordecai's view that her position might be providential. Calling upon others to fast with her, being willing to risk everything. She risked her position, she risked her life. Anything that was necessary, she did to try to help her people, to try to help God. Esther proved far more than just a pretty face. A model daughter, free to act as she chooses, but yet she carefully weighs Mordecai's advice. She's a model person of faith, devoted to God and his people. As Esther proves herself to be a true daughter of Sarah, beautiful on the outside, perhaps, as was Sarah, but even more so on the inside, as all women of God should be. I would hope that all of our women can, can see some of Esther in themselves. It is so important that, you know, yes, as, as men, we have the ultimate responsibility, but you know what? We don't make decisions in a vacuum, do we? We need as much information. If we're going to make sound uh, decisions in our life, whether it be about our family, whether it be about our congregation, we cannot make those decisions in a vacuum. We need as much information as we can to make those. Now, here's where I wanted to take a few minutes and think about David, Esther, Paul, actually just about any named character in the Bible that we can think of. Why did God choose them? Why did God choose David? David, David had an affair. David had a man sent to his own death. What about Paul? When we first see Paul, he's Saul. He's, he's consenting to the stoning of Stephen. He's, he's putting... He's putting all the Christians that he can find in prison. Why, why would God select him? Why would God select any of us? Why does, what, what are, how are we special to God? Well, I think the answer simply comes down to, to this. Look at how Saul reacts in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, when Saul is on the, he's on the road to Damascus, he's, he's getting ready to, to spread his influence, his, uh, his, uh, his, his horrible ways of, of throwing Christians in prison. He's, he's willing to take that beyond Judea, beyond Israel. He's going out to Damascus. He had to get special letters to do so from the council. He got them. He's on his way to put more people in prison. And yet he meets God. He meets Christ on the road. And what does he do? What is his reaction? Upon learning of his mistake, upon learning of his error of his ways, if you will, he instantly changes. Shortly after he is, he is uh, in Damascus, Ananias comes, the, the scales fall from his eyes, he receives his sight back. Where do we find Saul? We find him in the, uh, uh, we find him in, uh, oh goodness, I'm going to lose the word here. We find him preaching God in the synagogues. That's what we see. This is a man who was just coming to Damascus to take all the Christians and throw them in prison, as many as he could find. And yet, because of his meeting on the road, he now goes to the synagogue and he preaches Christ. He changes immediately. David, when we see David, why, why David? 
What happens when David is confronted with the error of his ways? What does he do? Does he does he follow the example of of, of many of our our leaders and politicians in our country today, where they deny, they 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 deflect, they spin, they try to get away with things? No. The moment David hears that he is the one who has committed these atrocities, he immediately takes full full responsibility for them. He says, I have sinned against God. I have sinned against my people. And he immediately repents. That is the kind of person that God can use. We don't need uh, a know-it-all who, who thinks they know even better than God. I mean, we have enough people that claim to be uh, scientists nowadays that claim that. We have so many people nowadays that claim that, you know, yeah, the, the whole story of evolution is a fact where there is still absolutely no evidence that it is a fact because it is not a fact. But yet we, we, we need to believe these people. How about we turn to God? How about we turn to God and we follow his word? How much simpler would this world be? How much simpler would this life be if we followed God? You know, we have so many of our leaders that want to do everything they can to remove God from any form of public life. But we need to speak up. We need to be true to God. Esther in our story this evening, she spoke up to save her people because Haman was a very self-centered person who wanted things his way. Not going to happen. In the book of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar makes the, makes the decree that nobody can bow to any other God except him. What does Daniel do? He goes to his home. He opens the windows. He prays on his knees as was his custom. He changed nothing. Just because the king made a decree, Daniel was not going to follow that because he knew it was proper to follow God. We need to understand that. Now, God doesn't want us to inspire violence against others. That's not what we are about. I've heard enough stories in the, in the past year and a half about how when the, when the uh, Spanish moved into the country of Chile, they forced people to be Christian. They said you either become Christian or you die. So that's how Chile became a mostly Christian company by, or a country by force. Does God want us to force anyone to be a Christian? No, it has to be our own decision. Coming to Christ is very, very individual in nature. And it's individual in nature because you know, as I'm looking, as I'm looking at the people on Zoom here, you know, Brad, I've got you uh, kind of first and foremost on the screen there. So I'm, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. But, you know, Brad, you're, you're a different person than I am. You have different weaknesses and different strengths than I have. So you cannot repent for me and I cannot repent for you. Coming to God is very individual, but it's something we all need to do. We all need to understand that, you know, in becoming a Christian, we first have to hear the word of God. If we don't hear the word of God, what, what are we becoming? If we hear the word of God and we believe that word, we're on the right track. Now, in hearing that word, believing that word, we now have to make 
a very serious choice in our lives. The serious choice is to repent and follow God or reject God. Now, if we repent and we follow God, we do still need to confess him before men so he will confess us before his father. We need to be baptized. We need to have our sins washed away. It is so important that we do not forget any of these steps. Upon rising from those waters of baptism, we need to live faithful, obedient lives to Christ. It's that simple to become a Christian. It, it doesn't take rocket scientists to become a Christian. It takes common sense, which in this land we live today is almost dead. But it takes common sense and it takes being true to yourself. Who is it that can deceive us the most? Is it our, our friends, our loved ones? Or is it ourselves? Sometimes we can be our, our harshest critics. Sometimes we can be more lenient on ourselves than we should. Sometimes we rationalize away things that we do that are wrong. None of these things should happen in becoming a Christian. So we become a Christian, we live faithful lives, but you know what? That doesn't mean the story ends there. Becoming a Christian is just the beginning. When we become a Christian and we start to live that life, we can get lost. Several years back, I had cataract surgery, and before the surgery, I thought I was seeing just fine. I thought I was seeing things just as clear as, as, as I had always seen them. But then after the surgery, it took about two or three days for the, the, the effects of the surgery and the fact that I've got new lenses in my eyes and all that. It took, it took a little while for that to, to, uh, to settle in and take place. But lo and behold, I see things far clearer now than I had in years. I did not realize how much I was missing. Well, as Christians, sometimes we get lost. As Christians, the path we need to follow is, is sometimes rather narrow. Sometimes it's difficult to stay on. But in staying on that, or, or in walking that path, where do we as Christians like to walk? Do we walk safely in the center of the path? Or do we like so many like to just, we like to, to push the edge. We like to walk right on the boundary, the edge of that path. Unfortunately, if we walk at the very edge of the path, it's easy to take one, one misstep and we're no longer on that path. But that's where we like to reside. We like to stay right there on the edge of that path. But when we fall off the path, when we get turned around, when we lose focus, there is still something, there is still hope as long as we have life in our bodies, as long as we still have air in our, in our lungs. And that is we can return to God. Think of the story of the, uh, of the prodigal son. When did the father see that prodigal son? Did he wait till the son walked right up, knocked on the door and said, Dad, I'm home? No. When you read that story, the father sees the son while he is still far off. And he runs to that son. And he hugs that son. And he has the servants bring sandals, puts a robe on him, puts rings on his finger. His son was lost. He was dead. But now he is found. He's alive. God is waiting for us so that he can do that for us. If you have need to respond to the invitation, please let the elders know as we prepare to sing our closing song.
Thank you, Brother Chambers, for your lesson tonight. Wait, whoops. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm having problems with my headphone today. Uh, thank you for your lesson tonight. Um, your brother Job this morning was describing the number of different kinds of sermons that can be presented and, you know, a good character study. Uh, there, is so, there is so much um, wealth of knowledge there to be had. You had, met, you, know, you had asked the question, you know, why did God include, you know, uh, this person to be uh, in the Bible? Why, what of their lives is to be impressed upon us? And, um, you know, one of my favorites that you brought up is Daniel. Um, the courage that he had to face the things that he did. Um, and, you know, we, we, we all kind of hope and pray for that kind of courage. But then we look at, you know, people like Peter, who thought they had all the courage in the world. And then, uh, lo and behold, he ends up denying Christ. And again, I mean, when faced with that kind of thing, who knows how we would ourselves would react. So seeing that, you know, the people that God presents in his good word um it's just it's it's wonderful to to dive into and i i you know we all appreciate uh you bringing the message tonight uh brother job always good to see you brother bob and uh yes i've enjoyed uh just being reminded of esther uh what a courageous woman uh, Beauty is certainly more than uh, skin deep. And uh, it's good. we've spent so much time with our uh, speaking on men, but we forget about oftentimes the heroes who are women in the Bible. By the way, of the four gospels, Luke gives more uh, attention to women than the other three gospel accounts. Uh, I've intended, I think I preached one lesson on that uh, years ago. I probably need to speak a little bit more on that. But it's, uh, Luke gives us more detail concerning women. And so thank you for reminding us of that. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, whatchamacallit, is there um, anything we need to mention? <laughs> well, please keep the uh, Samarco family in your prayers and mm -hmm. their loss, uh, along with uh, Allie Kane. Uh, that was her brother that uh, died this week. Uh, only thing I've been able to do is text with Sister Samarco. And um, they're not going down there now. They're playing a service later on uh, for him. This was evidently, this was not something that was sudden. Uh, I guess he was in declining health for some time. So um, uh, we know, a lot of us know what it means to lose close loved ones like that. And I uh, asked Sister Teresa if she was close. She said yes. And uh, even though it was uh, the other side of the family, um, uh, this man was very close to her father who uh, died well, what, about a year ago, something like that. So less than a year ago, because of the COVID was going on. So uh, keep them in your prayers. There are other people, of course, who are suffering, who have uh, lost loved ones due to the pandemic. Uh, we have been very blessed here. Uh, so that's about all I have. Is there a way to get Allie's uh, address or anything? Because all we do is see her on on uh, Zoom. We don't have her address to send a condolence card or anything. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have my phone with me right now. Um, so I, I I think I have her address. Sister Mary Ann, do you have her address? You have to unmute yourself. Hmm. Nope, you're still muted, sister. I think we just lost. <laughs> um, no, uh, she turned off the video. Oh, that, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. She hit the wrong button. <laughs> no worries. Can you hear me? Yes, Brother Daryl. Yeah, I wanna. I want prayers for to find stability financially and to find a place to live 
before Christmas. Absolutely. So I had the job. Everything's working out with that. It's just uh, getting to that point. So We'll include those in the prayers tonight for sure. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. If nothing else, why don't we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Let's bow our heads. O righteous King on high, dear Lord, we stand amazed, Heavenly Father, and with all the people that you have given us, given us information of and described their lives throughout uh, your good word, dear Lord, and we are grateful for every portion of your word that is, that is good for us, Heavenly Father. We are just marvel in its complexity, yet rich and wonderful content that everything that we have in there is all we need for our lives, dear Lord, to, um, to be able to learn from Heavenly Father. But dear Lord, we also are so grateful to have that spirit that dwells within us, that you have given us freely, Heavenly Father, of your Son as well. And you have given us opportunity to come to you in prayer, which we do so even right now. And there are some people hurting out there, Heavenly Father. We pray, dear Lord, for our own sister, Ellie Kane, who has lost her brother for the rest of the family as they grieve for their loss. And dear Lord, our own brother, Mishki, has come forward tonight asking for prayers, Heavenly Father, for the stability he asks for. Dear Lord, help, help him receive that guidance, the comfort. Heavenly Father, open those doors and, and help him to, uh, to, to obtain a, a home some place that he can call his own, that he can rest soundly and, and, in, and in just in be, be able to move forward and, and, and progress, dear, dear Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the job that he has found himself in, that he's able to excel and use those gifts that you have given him, Heavenly Father. We know that you have blessed each and every one of us with a a one or multitude of gifts, dear Lord, and it's always a, a wonderful pleasure to be able to use the gifts that you give us, Heavenly Father, in our lives. So we thank you, dear Lord, for that. And Heavenly Father, for all those who are out there who are dealing with ailments and sicknesses and, and pains and aches, we pray for each one of them, Heavenly Father, some who have made them known, some who have not. But we pray relief for each one of them, dear Lord. We pray for... Um, the doctors who may be treating any one of them, that they are able to help them through it and figure out a cure, figure out um, what might be giving, able to give them more comfort. And dear Lord, as the world is being presented with this opportunity for a vaccination, Heavenly Father, we, we pray, dear Lord, that it ends up being a means of ends to this pandemic. But we pray, Heavenly Father, that it is, a, it is a good and safe thing, dear Lord. We know that there are concerns whenever something new like this comes out. And Heavenly Father, we pray for the patience that we may need as it is delivered. And again, we just pray that it is something that, again, will, again, be good and give us back some normalcy. And Heavenly Father, as this pandemic eventually comes to a close, Help us remember to not take for granted the things that we have had before the pandemic. Help us remember to continue looking towards you. And we pray for those people who have found you through all of this craziness, that they continue to, to learn more about you and seek you out and able to recognize what was missing from their lives before this and are able to even thank you even for this pandemic, bringing them to you. We are so blessed to have you as our God, as our Heavenly Father, to have your love, to have the strength, all the strength that we need because of you, Heavenly Father. If you are for us, who can be against us? We thank you, dear Lord, and we offer these prayers in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You are free to unmute yourself.